Okay, the recording has started. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Julie Navu. Um, Dr. Navu is an assistant press professor of English at Slippery Rock University. Her research areas include African American literature, American studies, performance studies, and gender and women's studies. She has published on early African American women writers, Harlem Renaissance authors, and code meshing. And her presentation today is called In an Era of Protest, How Unacknowledged Prejudice Sparked a Global Movement. Thanks Welcome. very much. Thanks very much for that introduction. And since um, Stacy Freeman's going to be doing the um, slides for me, I'll, I'll have a next kind of thing. And that's not meant to be like odd or uncomfortable in any way, but more just to kind of signal. So um, let me know when the slides are up on the screen. Great. So I'm starting today with a series of anecdotes, uh, stories from the news, and from my own experiences to serve as points of reflection and ways to draw connections between Sarah Lane Smith's 2019 Mary Lou is Everywhere and current events that have been in the news the past few years. And next slide. My first story. In a January 2017 interview following the presidential inauguration, Tom Barrick, who was President Trump's uh, presidential inaugural committee chairman, explains to CNN's Aaron Burnett why Kanye West, a staunch Trump supporter, would not be included in the inauguration's list of entertainers. Barrick states, now is the time for Americans to unite, following what he calls a uh, vociferous election. However, Barracks claims that the inauguration is not the venue for West because, as Barracks says, it's going to be typically and traditionally American. At a time for Americans to unite, the white American Barrack explains that West, who vocally supported Trump, is not typically or traditionally American enough to perform at the presidential inauguration, one of the most symbolic stage demonstrations of Americanness. Next slide. Now, many scholars in American and African American studies, myself included, have analyzed the legacy and lack of representation of Black Americans in American culture. As far back as the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s, uh, with a growing African American presence in mainstream American art, cultural critics noted the limited cultural spaces permitted to Black Americans. Alain Locke's 1922 essay, Steps Towards the Negro Theater, published in The Crisis, argues for a focus on Black American stage performances as a central part for racial progress. Locke explains that the Negro is already in the theater and has been there for a long time, but his presence there is not yet thoroughly normal. His audience is mainly a white audience, and the Negro actor has for a long time been asked to entertain this more or less alien group. And his contemporary W.E.B. Du Bois notes a similar concern when he writes, we can go on the stage. We can be just as funny as white Americans wish us to be. We can play all the sordid parts that America likes to assign to Negroes, but for anything else, there is still small place for us. Now, more recently, documentarian Marlon Riggs's Color Adjustment and Ethnic Notions examined race relations in America and their connections to how black Americans have been portrayed in American culture. Next slide. My second story. In October 2017, the school board vice president in Biloxi, Mississippi, made headlines for banning texts such as To Kill a Mockingbird because there is some language that makes people uncomfortable. Now, this is despite the fact that the text is listed as part of the curriculum for the Common Core state standards. The language that makes people uncomfortable is Harper Lee's use of the N word. However, a failure to discuss uncomfortable topics and why they are such problems leads to compounding problems. In the last few years, photographs of politicians and celebrities dressed in blackface have surfaced with regular frequency. The litany of names now in American social consciousness 
underscores how blackface continues to impact our 21st century worlds. However, other people, overwhelmingly white, repeatedly make excuses for publicly continuing the use of blackface. So continue slides. For example, in October 2018, Megyn Kelly commented on the Today Show that it was okay for white people to use blackface when dressing in costume. She quickly came under attack for these comments and followed with an apology. However, her statement includes no explanation for understanding why her comment necessitated apology. Kelly's comments and the subsequent cancellation of her show led to a CBS Sunday morning news segment later that month explaining the history of blackface. And next slide is my third story. In March 2020, Breonna Taylor was shot and killed in Louisville, Kentucky by police while in her apartment. Three police officers were investigated. However, none were indicted in September. Following this, several of the grand jury are now, as of January, accusing the Kentucky Attorney General and Louisville police for failing to provide key information regarding homicide charges. Throughout the last nine months, protests have been on have been ongoing in Louisville with dozens of protests and arrests. During the most heated moments, such as the grand jury's announcement, Louisville institutes nighttime stay-at-home orders. Now, prior to beginning my PhD program, I lived in Louisville, Kentucky for eight years. Uh, so I know the city well, and it's very much home. There's an unspoken but known racial divide in housing in Louisville that runs along the Roy Wilkins Boulevard, 19th Street in downtown Louisville. So next slide. White people live to the east of the line and black people live to the west of the line. It's well known enough, but not talked about. Uh, so much so that local comedians will make jokes about it and everyone laughs. laughs. Now on the map, I've drawn the line in red and I've included Breonna Taylor's apartment address. Louisville segregation, like in most cities, wasn't caused by a single event or moment. There's a long and varied segregated history in Louisville, but today, uh, rather than trying to cover the entire history, I'll focus on one reason related to why Taylor's death by police incited such overwhelming anger and action. Now, first, keep in mind this map that's on the screen now before I move to the next. Got it? Next slide. All right, this new map is from 1938, prepared by the Homeowners Lona Corporation. It lists the predominantly Black communities in Louisville as overwhelmingly, definitely declining or hazardous whereas the more predominantly white communities have greater areas of best and still desirable layers. Uh, the homeowners loan corporation determined which areas were safe for banks to lend people money for home purchases. Living in areas marked red and yellow made it more difficult to get approved for a loan and would guarantee higher interest rates with lower property values for the loan. While the organization did good work following the Great Depression as part of Roosevelt's New Deal, it simultaneously penalized Black Americans, lowered their property values if they owned, and making it more difficult and expensive to gain home ownerships. And Louisville's story isn't a one-off city in the United States. Next slide. There's thousands of examples in our nation's history of moments of prejudice that on the surface seem isolated yet tell generational stories of unacknowledged pain caused by our inactions in our country. This is a screenshot of an interactive map that you can access via the hashtag BLMMAP. It includes links to various news agencies articles from across our country of protests supporting Black Lives Matter movement. And at this point, it's now a global movement. While the specific reasons in other countries may be different from our own, the message remains the same. People of color, specifically black people, have gotten an unfair shake in countless areas of the globe. Next slide. In 
This is the global view by the same organization. Many of the articles linked on the website include interviews with protesters explaining the reasons for their protests. Often, these protests are sparked by confrontations between Black members of our communities and local police officers. However, the first rallying cry of Black Lives Matter is currently understood as a response to Trayvon Martin's death at the hands of George Zimmerman in February of 2012. And remember Breonna Taylor in Louisville. Taylor's death wasn't a single isolated moment. It came after centuries of inequality in housing in our communities, unresolved issues of representation in our media and public spaces, and an unwillingness, even in our institutions of learning and education, to make ourselves uncomfortable and truly address these issues. Next slide. Racism, prejudice, and legacies of segregation do not live comfortably in our past. They're an ever-present shadow, a darkening of 21st century American consciousness. And when you hear the specialists, the academics, the people like me uh, locked away in our ivory towers, throw around words like systemic racism, white privilege, and police brutality, we're not talking about the one event last week, or the last year, or the last decade. Here's why Mary Lou is everywhere seems so familiar. And it isn't because the author mentions Giant Eagle and the towns you've driven through. That's what the reviews about the novel praise, the regional appeal and realness. Rather, Mary Lou is everywhere, I argue, feels so familiar because the comments made by the townspeople regarding Jude are the ones that we've heard in our own lives over and over whether we're from Pennsylvania, like the novel setting, from Western Kentucky, like me, or many other places in the United States. And now I've got on this next few uh, slides, quotes uh, from the novel specifically that I'll kind of do quick readings of uh, with the quotes. And then I've added all of the bold text to really draw your attention to the specific language that's happening. So in the novel, shortly after Jude goes missing, the narrator tells the reader, still all the men standing around were muttering about she must have gotten herself into some bad business, dealing drugs like her kind usually did. But what they really meant was she was black. Well, mixed. But in Greene County, that meant basically the same thing, and she was the only black person in school. Later, readers are given the information. For some people, Jude had gotten herself into whatever trouble had swallowed her up. Believers of this notion spoke in sweet and pitying ways. They said drugs. What people meant was Jude was a brown girl and the bad things happened for a reason. When police interview a man in an area bar regarding seeing Jude after her disappearance, he says, they all look the same to me, although it wasn't clear if he meant black girls or underaged ones. Now, I acknowledge as a reader that part of the reason uh, we aren't given information this way is that we're to see and understand the world via the eyes of Cindy, a young impressionable girl. However, the novel's structure is a murder mystery and the withholding of information as a way of building suspense for drama in the genre means that the only impressions reader get of Jude is via Cindy's perspective. And there's no acknowledgement within the text that statements such as these indicate prejudice against Jude, only a slight impression via piecing together different statements, can, even, can readers even understand that perhaps police didn't take Jude's missing seriously because she is a Black woman? Initially, the novel, via Cindy's perspective, describes Jude's father as Alistair Vanderjohn. Oh, sorry, next slide. A college professor and a Black man all at once. Whether he came to visit, you could feel the effort people made not to stare, just like you could feel us all move our eyes around Jude. When Cindy sees Alistair handing out flyers, she says, I recognized him from the TV. He was Jude's dad, although I might have known anyways because I had never seen a black man in Sissy Spijek's store. And then uh, Cindy, as the narrator, comments more on him being a stranger. Then. Sissy treats Alistair by rolling her eyes like he was being ridiculous. And after he leaves the store, uh, Sissy talks to Cindy and says, can you believe it? 
I didn't even know you could get internet on, on, a, on an Obama phone. Just not fancy enough, are we, Cindy? Nobody ever gave me a damn thing. I never needed a handout. Then Cindy abruptly leaves the cafe. There's no questioning or notice on Cindy's part that what Sissy says about Vanderjohn is in any way less than acceptable, hurtful, or something worth reflecting on. Additionally, moments like the Obama phone carry a lot of political weight, especially for a novel published in 2019 in a post-Obama during Trump presidency. Next slide. When readers get info on what Cindy's mother thinks of Jude, we're told she called Jude a G-bell and a gigolo. She feared for Virgil's idiocy because he has been dating Jude. And then Cindy tells the reader, my mother was the kind who would always be very offended if you called her a racist. She talked about it all sideways at best. The most you could get out of her was, I don't approve. And she trusted that she did not need to speak any further on the subject, as generally she did not. Whoever she was talking to usually knew exactly what she meant. Her disapproval met in the air uh, with the disapproval of whoever she was talking to, and the two silent moods married and had their own life in the air all over us, in the water, in the mind. That was the trick to it, never having to say what you actually meant. Nothing is real if you don't have to say it. The trick, of course, is that nothing is real about race issues is true only for white people in a community in the US. This is the privilege of whiteness, only needing to engage with race in America when you want to do so. Next slide. In chapter 13, the novel continues the genre of murder mystery with false leads regarding Jude's disappearance, such as she matched Jude's descriptions as one lead, but that's all the information provided. Later, a white woman claims to be Jude, but the novel explains that this woman was strictly Caucasian and middle-aged. No matter what she said to the contrary, she told the detective that she had been abducted by a big black buck and made to do unchristian things, which she described with uninterruptible zeal. Both the earlier comment about Jude's involvement in drugs and this statement about the black man as a buck feed into well-established stereotypes regarding black Americans. The, if this is a topic that interests you specifically, I encourage you to take a look at the 2016 documentary 13th. Um, it's available for free uh, via Netflix and YouTube and it analyzes how the antagonistic relationship between Black people and law enforcement began as early as um, the Civil War era as a means of controlling and enforcing um, enslaved people. But in addition to this reinforcement of stereotypes, which again, the novel does not question, the narrative comments on the zeal that this woman experienced when relating her fictional story of abuse by a black man. To add to this, after Jude is rescued, Richard the kidnapper speaks to the media. Some people, they think everything is about race these days, not me, I look beyond. I thought her light could be made a little better with my help is all. Some women just need the right environment to flower. As part of its narrative technique, the author keeps Jude's viewpoint silent until the very end as a means of building suspense. But the effect is that Jude is silenced. There's little or no acknowledgement from the townspeople of the trauma of abduction and being held prisoner. Those getting discussed are the ones benefiting an emotional thrill from Jude's suffering. Next slide and heads up, spoiler alert. When Jude is rescued and returns, she becomes even more conspicuous in town. And I'll let you guys read through that uh, larger quote while I comment on some specifics about it. Um, I'd like to point out that she's still just the only black person in the country. She's treated like she is magic. Uh, one of the townspeople decides to clip a chunk of her hair 
They dig through her trash. Uh, they bring her um, those who are ill as though she can heal them. And then um, if that wasn't enough, could she not tell them something about living in the terrible lasting moments that would break your heart? As though Jude is something to be used only for the services of the white community. At the novel's end, Jude is forced to leave her hometown as the only way to escape the effects of her kidnapping. However, I need to point out that this isn't the trauma of the kidnapping she must escape. It's the repeated trauma inflicted on her by her own townspeople, even to the point of her neighbors, people she's known for years, asking her to relive this experience, the terrible moments, for their own pleasure. Like the novel itself, reviews largely ignore Jude's race, despite a repeated mention of it. Much like the school district in Mississippi uh, with To Kill a Mockingbird, it's easier just not to talk about it. Next slide. So now to come out of the novel and to put it back into perspective about the work these kinds of conversations are doing, like the generations of protesters in the past, it's the young adults leading us while we resist the urge to ignore these comments and encounters in our own lives. In tandem with the continuing, continuing story of Breonna Taylor, the University of Kentucky basketball team released video in support of Black Lives Matter. Even during a socially distanced global pandemic, college students found ways to voice their ideas and message. The team continues to use their platform as the faces of Big Blue Nation to advocate their cause. And if you aren't from Kentucky, you do not understand the power that the men's basketball team holds as public figures. Last month, the team kneeled during the national anthem prior to a game at Florida. The action received praise and criticism across the Commonwealth. Lexington Herald Leader reported one fan as saying, I'm a 75 year old white male who has been a lifetime fan of UK basketball. I have never been more proud of my chosen team and coaches was when they took a stand by kneeling. It takes courage and support to support a principle. Uh, next slide. But another fan responded to the kneeling with, I don't condone racism or violence and believe that all our citizens should be treated with respect. I respect their right to protest, to have different opinion than me, but I don't think the national anthem is the place for that. Like the Capitol building and halls of Congress, some things are sacred. I will not watch the game tonight. I actually will quit watching UK basketball altogether because it's also my right to support teams, coaches, and universities that I believe in. I find it hard to believe that 12, 19 year old kids, most of them who have only been here one year and will be gone next year, will destroy my 60 years of support of UK basketball. But I have no choice. Next slide. And this is my end. Remember that so much of the civil rights era centered on the activism and the bravery of the young adults. Among others, this included the Little Rock Nine, integrating schools, the Greensboro Four, sitting at the whites-only lunch counter in North Carolina, the National Students Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who joined the Freedom Rides, and so many others. Perhaps in reading and questioning texts like Mary Lou is Everywhere, we can use institutions of learning as places of discussion about topics like race, prejudice, and protest that make people uncomfortable and lead to global movements. Thank you. Thank you so much for that relevant and incredibly timely presentation. Um, we're going to open the floor now for questions. So you are free to turn on your microphones and directly ask questions, or if you'd like, you can simply um, type your questions into the chat box. Uh, 
Are there any questions? Lorraine, did you want to ask a question? I just want to, I'm turning on things here, sorry. <laughs> I turn off my camera in between so that um, I serve, you know, my internet's not too reliable. Um, but I just wanted to say, this is such a complicated topic, you don't even know where to start. You know, I think that's part of the silence here is, I don't even know what question to ask. I've had some strange experiences recently. My daughter just moved to Milwaukee. Well, she's been there about five years, but when she moved there, people told her, and this came from, she works with a large variety of people. She works with people who are, you know, black and white. She has somebody who's from Yugoslavia, from Mexico, you know, from Canada. And all of those people told her to stay off of this one street in Milwaukee, that you just don't go there ever, and you don't go there at night especially. And she was shocked, and she didn't know what to do about that. She didn't know if she should agree to that or if she should say why. You know, she didn't even know what to do. But it was such a, a traumatic thing for her to experience. Yeah, and I mean, so, like, I had a lot of ideas, right? And it's like 20 minutes, try to connect the novel, but trying to, like, also bring in, like, the, the history, the cultural understandings, the ways people are feeling, right? Like there were a lot of like moves happening and there's some things I connected better than others. Um, but I you felt great while- job. I really enjoyed the so, presentation. Thanks. But I felt like while reading Mary Lou is Everywhere, um, you know, and Stacy and I talked about the novel um, earlier this semester, this fall, um, about the talk. Um, so I knew the novel was set in Pennsylvania, but at the same time, you know, if my accent doesn't give it away entirely, um, I'm not from here originally. So sometimes critiquing an area as an outsider can really alienate groups. And it can also overlook the problems of our own experiences and actions that we've contributed to. So that's why I picked on the story of Breonna Taylor is, you know, that's that's happening on the streets that I know. And, you know, it's it's my family living in Louisville who are staying in at night while the protests are going on. And, you know, trying to think about what sides are they taking, what's happening, right? So, you know, maybe if we take the story of Breonna Taylor and look at Pittsburgh or even some of the events that have happened in our own lives, in our own towns. You know, like you mentioned with the crossing of the street and really kind of start to understand how ingrained in our everyday lives so many issues of prejudice really are. I, th I think you touched on many different issues that I would I would really like to highlight one of the things you talked about was the idea that um, some individuals are not American enough. Um, Toni Morrison talks about this. Um, she believed that Americanness is marked by whiteness, and that um, anyone who is non-white is considered non-American or in some ways is considered an American with a modifier like African American or Asian American or something of that nature. But you also talked about the other ways that um, that racism manifests in our country. Um, you, you know, censoring books because language makes people uncomfortable. Um, you were talking about housing segregation, and in the previous town that I lived in, there was a division street uh, that that clear. And it was called Division Street, and it clearly divided the town. You discussed algorithmic bias. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Which of the forms of racism that you listed today, which which of them do you think is the most pervasive? 
And my second question to you is, um, do you believe that Mary Lou is everywhere is racist? Okay, those are, those are easy and hard questions. Okay, so the, the easy side of it is that the worst kind of racism is the racism that you don't not realize you are doing or that is a part of your life. Okay, so if for that, that for you is turning on the television every night or streaming Netflix, because what else are we gonna do in our rooms that we never leave? Um, and you realize at some point, uh, and you're a white person, you realize that every person on the TV is white, then maybe that's the problem because you're not having exposure to anyone else's views or ideas or experiences of the world. Um, you know, living in um, rural Pennsylvania now, um, maybe for me, the most pervasive part of racism in my life is the fact that I live in a very segregated town. It's rural PA. Um, there's, it's overwhelmingly white here. Um, maybe um, part of our lives as, for those of you who are administrators, you know, people on college campuses, is the acknowledgement of underrepresentation of people of color on our college campuses. Not just that every school needs to be very, very racially diverse, but that our schools don't even represent the level of diversity that the communities that we're drawing from do. Okay, so I think for each of us, it's a little bit different in terms of just what is the most sinister or pervasive type of racism that we're dealing with. Um, regarding Mary Lou is everywhere as racist, okay, so, I worked as a PhD student for Vershawn Ashanti Young, who's a really big scholar in um, code meshing and um, the study of how language is used in classrooms, you know, the push between standard English and um, approving or supporting Englishes of people from different backgrounds and kind of the questioning the idea that there's different spaces that are appropriate. And when Dr. V emailed me or interviewed me to work with him as a research assistant, he asked me, do I think that I'm a racist? And he, this is a formidable, well-known black man asking me who is visibly, unquestionably a white woman, um, if I'm a racist. And I said, yes, I don't think it's possible to have lived and been raised in the United States and not to have been informed by and um, embraced aspects of this. So I say this to say that yes, the, the text is racist in some level. I don't think that that is necessarily a critique of Sarah Elaine Smith. Sorry, I got my book here. So I keep looking over there. I don't think that's a critique um, necessarily of Smith's like writing style. Um, actually, I just finished teaching in my classes where the crawdads sing um, by Delia Owens. It's a wildly successful book. She does the same kinds of things in the book where she it's set in the 1960s and she mentions these aspects regarding segregation, but then never does anything with it. And the story makes complete sense without that in there, and yet it's included. Thank you. Yeah. Are, are, are there any other questions? I'm going to take that silence as no. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. It was phenomenal. Um, I appreciate, and on behalf of the, the, the Common Book Committee, uh, we fully appreciate that you are willing to give this presentation. Thank you. No, thanks very much. I mean, when am I ever going to turn up, turn uh, down the opportunity to get to talk about things that are, I'm really interested in and concerned about? 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.